Okay, we gotta wait for our Umze to get back in. <laughs> but I'm gonna get our speaker on. So I'm gonna lose audio for a moment. So give us a second on this. So we're going to give Marie a few moments to get back in. She agreed to be Umze, but um, unfortunately due to a technical issue, as we moved the room when we started recording, I have no idea why. It was very strange. There she is. All right. Welcome back, Marie. You were the unfortunate uh, victim of a technical issue when we started the recording. It was very weird. I got this weird notice. So welcome back. <laughs> um, let's start the prayers. Marie, I think you're still on mute. You have to unmute me. I can't unmute. Thank you. And is someone presenting? Yeah, it should be on the screen. Mm, not seeing it. Well, we'll just wing it. Teacher, fellow destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, fellow destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni to you, I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. Teacher, foe destroyer, thus gone, fully and perfectly awakened Buddha, endowed with knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, knower of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men, Buddha, foe destroyer, glorious victorious one, Shakyamuni to you I pay homage, make offerings, Knowledge and good conduct, gone to bliss, know of the world, helmsman of ordinary beings to be tamed, supreme one, teacher of all gods and men. But I lost my place. Glorious, victorious one, Shakyamuni, to you I pay homage, make offerings, and go for refuge. When you, chief of humans, were born, you took seven steps on this great earth, and you said, I am supreme in this world. 
to you who are wise at that time, I prostrate. Completely pure body, supremely fine form, ocean of wisdom like a golden mountain, fame that blazes in the three worlds, supreme protector to you, I prostrate. Endowed with the supreme marks, a face like the stainless moon, a color like gold, to you I pay homage. The three worlds are not like you who is free from dust. Matchless one, endowed with knowledge, to you I prostrate. Protector endowed with great compassion, omniscient teacher, feel devotion-like merits and good qualities, to the thus gone I prostrate. Through purity, free from attachment, through virtue, releases from the evil gone realms, unique, supreme, ultimate meaning, to the Dharma that brings peace, I prostrate. From freedom, teaching the path, well abiding in the pure trainings, holy field endowed with good qualities, to the Sangha also, I prostrate. Homage to the Supreme Buddha, homage to the Dharma refuge, homage to the great Sangha, to all three, ever devout homage, to all worthy of respect, bowing with bodies as many as all realms, atoms, and all aspects, with supreme faith, I pay homage. Do not commit any non-virtuous action, accumulate virtue and goodness, subdue your own mind. This is the teaching of the Buddha. Like a star, a mirage, a lamp, illusions, drops of dew, bubbles, dreams, lightning and clouds. Look at all conditioned phenomena as such. Due to this merit, having attained the state of the all seen and thereby subduing the enemy of faults, may I liberate migrators from the ocean of existence, stirred by the waves of aging, sickness and death. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge in the Guru, I take refuge in the Buddha, I take refuge in the Dharma, I take refuge in the Sangha. I take refuge until I am enlightened in the Buddha, the Dharma and the Sangha. By the positive potential I create by listening to the Dharma, may I attain Buddhahood in order to benefit all sentient beings. May all sentient beings have happiness and the causes of happiness. May all sentient beings be free of suffering and the causes of suffering. May all sentient beings be inseparable from the joyful happiness that is free from suffering. May all sentient beings abide in equanimity, free from holding some close and others distant. Respectfully, I prostrate with my body, speech, and mind. I present clouds of every type of offering, actual and imagined. I confess all my negative actions accumulated since beginningless time and rejoice in the virtuous actions of all ordinary and noble beings. Please, Buddha, remain as our guide and turn the wheel of Dharma until samsara ends. Through the merit created by myself and others, may the two bodhicittas ripen. And may I attain Buddhahood for the sake of all such and beings. This offering I make of a precious jeweled mandala, together with other pure offerings and wealth and the virtues we have collected throughout the three times with our body, speech, and mind. All my masters, my idams, and the three precious jewels, I offer all to you with unwavering faith, accepting these out of your boundless compassion. Please send forth waves of your blessings. Yidam Guru Ratna Mandala Kam Narati Yami. Connor is Marie back. Uh, she was back and then she left and then she was back and then she left. So, okay, I'll continue. continue. Okay, I prostrate to the Arya Triple Gem. Thus did I hear at one time. The Bhagavan was dwelling on Mass of Vultures Mountain on Rajagriya, together with a great community of monks and a great community of bodhisattvas. At that time, the Bhagavan was absorbed in the concentration on the categories of phenomena called profound perception. Also at that time, the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara looked upon the very practice of the profound perfection of wisdom and beheld those five aggregates also as empty of inherent nature. Then, through the power of Buddha, the Venerable Shariputra said this to the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, 
How should any son of the lineage train who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom? He said that, and the Bodhisattva, Mahasattva, Arya, Avalokiteshvara, said this to the venerable Sharivati Putra. Shariputra, any son of the lineage or daughter of the lineage who wishes to practice the activity of the profound perfection of wisdom should look upon it like this. Correctly and repeatedly be holy in those five aggregates also is empty of inherent nature. Form is empty. Emptiness is form. Emptiness is not other than form. Form is also not other than emptiness. In the same way, feeling, discrimination, compositional factors, and consciousness are empty. Chariputra, likewise, all phenomena are emptiness without characteristic, unproduced, unceased, stainless, not without stain, not deficient, not fulfilled. Chariputra, therefore, in emptiness, there is no form, no feeling, no discrimination, no compositional factors, no consciousness, no eye, no ear, no nose, no tongue, no body, no mind, no visual form, no sound, no odor, no taste, no object of touch and no phenomenon. There is no eye element and so on and up to and including no mind element and no mental consciousness element. There is no ignorance, no extinction of ignorance and so on and up to and including no aging and death and no extinction of aging and death. Similarly, there is no suffering, origination, cessation and path. There is no exalted wisdom, no attainment and also no non-attainment. Shariputra, therefore, because there is no attainment, bodhisattvas rely on and dwell in the perfection of wisdom, the mind without obscuration and without fear. Having completely passed beyond error, they reach the end point of nirvana. All the Buddhas who dwell in the three times also manifestly completely awaken to unsurpassable, perfect, complete enlightenment in reliance on the perfection of wisdom. Therefore, the mantra of the perfection of wisdom, the mantra of great knowledge, the unsurpassed mantra, the mantra equal to the unequaled, the mantra that thoroughly pacifies all suffering should be known as the truth since it is not false. The mantra of the perfection of wisdom is declared tayata, gate gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhisoha. Tayata gate gate, paragate, parasamgate, bodhisattva. Shariputra, the bodhisattva mahasattva should train in the profound perfection of wisdom like that. Then the Bhagavan arose in that concentration and commended the bodhisattva mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, saying, Well said, well said, son of the lineage, it is like that, it is like that. One should practice the profound perfection of wisdom just as you have indicated. Even the Tathagatas rejoice. The Bhagavan having thus spoken, the Venerable Sharivari Putra, the Mahasattva Arya Avalokiteshvara, those surrounding in their entirety, along with the world gods, humans, Asuras, and Gandharvas, were overjoyed and highly praised. That's spoken by the Bhagavan. All right. Well, hello, everybody. Good morning. Can you hear me? All right, great. Um, my name is uh, Brad Yergain, and I'm going to give a talk this morning on um, the Lom Room. So pretty big subject um, to talk about in one day. And so, so my, uh, my disclaimer is, is that I am going to um, give a talk about my experience and kind of my path and journey um, as a Dharma practitioner and, uh, and a, a Lamrim practitioner, I guess. 
So, um, you know, I want to I want to start the talk with just talking generally about the long run because maybe some people, um, you know, um, haven't um, read through it or have kind of um, like a uh, haven't had the experience of reading the long run. And so, you know, the long run is this kind of like massive text that um, that has a lot of structure to it. You know, it has an outline that kind of goes through and kind of um, lays out all the different topics. You know, and I really, um, I really like that about the long rim is that there's a lot of structure, and uh, it also, I think it, um, the reason it's like that is because it helps in terms of memorizing, and also being able to meditate on the long rim. You know, you go, you go to a certain topic, and there's there's bullet points that really um, kind of accentuate each, each topic. And so um, the thing that I like about the long run also is that it's practical advice. And a lot of the, um, the texts that have been translated, um, um, Liberation in the Palm of Your Hand is a good example. It's, it's really um, you know, teaching that is giving like practical advice about how to practice. And I also appreciate that element of the long run. So um, before even um, Starting to talk about my experience. Um, the other thing I really appreciate about um, the Dharma is is that usually at the beginning of a text they talk about where the text came from, and and with the Long Rim text, um, there's a great deal of time spent on talking about Atisha, and so Atisha is is the person who um, compi compiled the Long Rim and uh, and actually brought it to Tibet, you know, and that. Um, his whole story is really worth reading, you know, and I um, particularly, you know, when he goes to Sumatra and receives the teachings on Bodhicitta. And it's amazing how, you know, these days, um, for me, sometimes it's hard to get to the temple or it's hard to do my practice or it's hard to do these little things. You know, when you read these biographies of the great teachers, it's just amazing how they spent their whole lives, you know, trying to, um, to practice and not only practice, but to, to pass it on to other people. You know, so it's um, that's amazing. And then even even uh, um, Lama Sankapa, who um, is credited with this version of the Lama Ren that that I have read and tried to practice, um, you know, his efforts to um, to pass on the Lama Ren and to and to compile the current um, book or the book that I that I've tried to practice is um, further um, inspiring. And so um, to start. Um, Kind of talking about myself a little bit, you know. I, um, you know, I was really primed to practice Dharma. You know, I I came from kind of this pretty dysfunctional family. My father had mental illness and, and alcoholism, and and it, it was pretty chaotic, you know. And I, um, I subsequently, as a teenager, you know, that was my solution to all my problems was to, um, you know, sedate myself and to and to try to block it all out. And I think some of that came from the fact that um, it seemed like life was kind of meaningless. You know, I, I would see, um, you know, a lot of my cohorts going to college and doing all these different things. And I, um, you know, I didn't, I didn't see the meaning in a lot of that stuff, you know, and, uh, and subsequently, you know, fortunately, you know, at the age of 21, I spent my 21st birthday in a treatment center. And that was the ultimate hum humiliation. I failed, you know. <laughs> you know, I had, I had tried to, um, you know, this was my attempt at dealing with life, you know, and and really, you know, treatment, twelve step programs, all that stuff really primed me for Dharma, you know. And so, um, you know, my uh, my first connection with um, with Buddhism was I hadn't even ever read anything about Buddhism at all, and I had. Um, I had uh, I'd taken this trip to South America and it was really mind expanding. You know, I was in these places that I, you know, around people that I didn't know in different cultures and these kind of big open spaces. And I came home and I um, I had had this book and I, about Buddhism and I started reading it. And I so I went to the library and I started reading everything I could about Buddhism. And it's funny because I think now I went to the library, you know, all you have to do now is just to pick up your phone and just, you know, you know, search something, but it, but at the time it was like, um, you know, I went to the library and I had all these books and one of the books said that you needed to find a teacher. And it was kind of odd thinking back on that, that that was the thing that I found was that you need to find a teacher. 
And so I was coming down the elevator in the library with that in mind, and there was a flyer for this Dharma Center that was in this part of town that I lived in and been in for a long time, but I'd never ever heard about this Dharma Center, you know? And so I, um, I went over there for a teaching, and there was a woman there who was, a, um, she was English, you know, she was kind of in her mid-40s, and she was a nun. And I'd never seen anybody that had, that had been ordained like that before. And it, it was just, it just, everything about it really amazed me, you know? And it, um, you know, there are a few times in my life where, um, you know, everything changed, you know? And walking into that Dharma Center, everything changed for me, you know? And, and it was a residential center and she gave talks in the long rim. And within a few months, I was a resident there. And I, um, and I was, I started this path of trying to, um, to be a Dharma practitioner, you know, and it, and it, um, you know, led in a lot of different directions. And so, um, you know, with that, I'd like to start talking about, um, the long rim, you know, and how that relates a little bit to this, um, this new practice that I had discovered, you know, um, you know, the long rim starts out with the initial scope. And the thing that, I really appreciate about the initial scope. It's kind of like sitting down with a really wise friend, you know, when you have a problem, it kind of tells you where you are, you know, and, and your situation. And, uh, you know, up until that point, I, um, you know, I, uh, you know, I had probably, I, you know, I was a student at a community college. I was trying to kind of figure out what my profession was going to be. You know, I had, uh, I, I decided that I was going to do nursing, you know, it seemed like a good way to go because I was like benefiting people and I was, um, you know, trying to, um, to develop as, you know, as a, um, as a person and, uh, you know, but I, I, I don't really, I didn't really have a way to evaluate kind of like my life, you know, and the, and the initial scope was able to do that for me. And I, I think that, um, you know, the long run seems very um, linear, and I think I've thought about it in a real linear kind of way, but it, it's really much more dynamic than that in some ways. It, and and, uh, and so, um, uh, let's see here. So, um, I guess the... Um, I'm kind of a little bit stuck here, but bear with me. All right, so back to the long rim is uh, is kind of is is a guy is guiding me, and so I um I guess it it's I it starts to the beginning of the long rim starts to talk about um you know the teacher the um you know our precious human life. You know, also, you know, death and impermanence, the initial scope kind of gives us this place of, uh, of where we are right now. And, uh, you know, I, um, I guess I realized that, you know, I have this, uh, I have this opportunity, you know, and, you know, before that it was like, you know, my opportunity was being sober and not drinking and trying to, um, to do something positive with my life. But, I, but as I started to practice Dharma, I realized there were a lot more, uh, it was a lot more broad than, than just this, um, you know, this kind of not, you know, experiencing and the suffering that I was experiencing. And so, um, you know, I made a pretty conscious decision to, to take refuge, you know, and, and to realize that, you know what, this was going to be my path, you know, and it wasn't, um, it was going to be something that I tried to practice my whole life, you know? And so, you know, taking refuge and the motivation of, um, of trying to deal with my suffering in kind of a productive way is kind of in the direction that I went, you know, I, um, you know, from the center that I was living in, I, I, um, got into nursing school. I moved to Seattle and I, there was another center that was affiliated with it. And so I, um, immediately like, I moved into that center and I became a part of that whole, um, um, community. And I, you know, I really, um, I really appreciated having the structure and the, um, and people to talk to. And it was, uh, um, 
you know, it was a great environment. And, you know, the thing that I didn't really realize was it was kind of like, it was like the, um, the honeymoon phase of my, my Dharma, um, activities. And I was, uh, I was living in a center that was part of the NKT tradition. And, uh, and there started to be a lot of things that were, would go on that I felt really uncomfortable about, you know, and I, um, you know, I had gone to England a few times and taken um, some empowerments from Geshe Kelsen Gyatso. And I was very, um, you know, involved in the center, but I had to, um, I had to make the decision at one point to decide like, what was, you know, what was, uh, you know, what was the, like the path for myself, you know? And, uh, and also at the time too, I felt like it was very restrictive practicing in that tradition. You know, they were, the, it was very, you know, you had to kind of read their books, go to their teachings. And it was, it was, a, um, anyway, I made the decision to, to leave, you know, and in, in some ways it was kind of, uh, I kind of used the long rim in some ways to, to help me with making that decision because I, I thought, you know what, it's like, you know, I've, I've made a lot of commitments and I'm taking a lot of practices and I, and I have to, um, I have to kind of follow my, I, my consciousness, you know, my conscience. And there were, there were some things that happened too, where there were some high level monks that had kind of broken their vows and there was a lot of kind of crazy stuff going on. And I was, and I thought to myself, you know what, I, um, I just don't really want to be a part of this, you know? And so I left. And, uh, and the great thing about it was in Seattle at the time, we had the, um, the Dharma Friends Foundation and, and Tupton Children was a teacher there. And there were a lot of visiting teachers. And, uh, and I, um, you know, I, it, was, it, was, it was a great time. And, and, you know, I was in my kind of early 30s and, and uh, I, I received a lot of great teachings and was able to try to um, put those into practice too in terms of doing retreats and, and, uh, and continue in my like daily practice. Um, you know, so the small scope kind of tells us where we're at and the, um, the intermediate scope kind of looks at renunciation and it looks at, you know, this path to liberation. And, uh, and I would, um, you know, I, I had spent a long time, um, you know, I came to Sacramento and, you know, I met my wife and, and we got married and we had um, two children. And I, I really, this, this mode of like, taking care of my family really clicked in for me. And, you know, my, my father wasn't really there for me that much, you know, and I, I felt like, you know what, I'm going to make things right. You know, I'm going to try to do the best that I can to take care of my kids. And I, and I got really kind of carried away with work, you know, it was really easy to work a lot. And, but, you know, and I continued to practice. And when my kids were little, what I did was I set up this closet in one of the bedrooms, you know, and, and I set my shrine up in there and I closed the door and I would go in there early in the morning thinking, all right, now I can meditate. And my kids invariably, when they would hear me, when they were, I mean, they were really little, like three or four, they would hear me wake up and they would always come into the, into where I'm meditating in the morning and just climb in next to me. And it was, uh, it was a great time, you know, and I thought, you know what? And I, and I just tried to practice with all this adversity, you know, I, I was working and I, I, I carry this pager around and I get called in in the middle of the night. And, and you know what, regardless of what, um, what was going on? It was like, there was always time to practice somewhere, you know, and there was always, a, um, you know, um, a place to squeeze in practice, you know? And so, you know, my kids, um, my kids grew up, you know, they're teenagers now, crazy, you know, my, um, my wife and I, we worked really hard to raise them. And I, and, and, you know, it's funny because in my mind, you know, you know, I always thought that I had a lot of control over what was going on you know, in life, you know, and I, and I, and I'm kind of a little bit of a control freak and a planner. I like to plan, you know, and, uh, you know, but it's, and I guess we have a certain amount of control. We have a control with what we're doing, like in the immediate, but there are a lot of things we don't have control over, you know, and, and that big realization came to me, you know, we had, uh, my wife and kids and I, we had gone on this trip to Japan, you know, and it was this amazing trip, you know, and, we'd seen these, you know, huge Buddhas, you know, and, 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 uh, and went to all these temples and, 
And we came home and it was about six days after we came home and I um, found my wife one morning, you know, on the ground in, in our house, you know, and she'd had this massive stroke and, uh, and she was only 46 years old and my kids were like 13 and 15 at the time. And I, um, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a nurse, you know, I was an ICU nurse and, and, and I, you know, my training kind of kicked in, you know, and I kind of, I mean, right away we got her to the hospital and, and, uh, and she, um, she was in the intensive care unit and, and, uh, my daughter was with me and, and it was, uh, um, it was a crazy, crazy time period. And, and the crazy part about it was all that stuff that I had practiced started to come out little by little. And my, um, my first natural reaction, a lot of times in life is like, why is this happening to me? You know, why, you know, when something bad happens, why is this happening to me? And I remember being in the ICU and just kind of like, you know, you're just there at all these crazy hours. And I remember saying that to myself and right away, I was like, this is happening. This isn't happening to just me. This is happening to everybody. You know, and I was looking around and there's like 10 beds there. And there were a lot of people that this was happening to. And then I started thinking about life in general and everybody has something like this that's happened, you know, maybe not as extreme, maybe more extreme, you know, and we, um, you know, my wife Eva was in the hospital for 44 days, you know, and we were there all the whole time. I mean, we, you know, we'd go home for little pieces of time and we'd all switch off and trade. And, and it was this, um, it was this really interesting time period where she went from all these different phases, you know, and having, being a nurse, I, I guess I had some of the benefit of knowing, you know, the direction it was going, but I didn't really, because, you know, every stroke is different, you know, and, and so, um, you know, it was strange at about, at about three weeks, she, um, she kind of opened her eyes and she was conscious after three weeks, you know, we sat there for all this time and we watched all these different phases that she went through and she came to at three weeks and she was like, what happened? <laughs> you know, and, and it was so bizarre. And it was like, you know, um, she went through this, this phase of where his doctor told her that she was never going to walk again. You know, and the next day she was up on her walker, <laughs> you know, pushing herself to walk again. And, uh, and you know, it's, um, it's easy to feel like sad at the loss, you know, it really is. And there was a lot of loss and there was a lot of sadness, but it's also pretty inspiring to see, you know, the progress that she made and the, and the distance that she's come. And I think, um, I think not having like Dharma practice, I mean, I don't know what would have happened if I didn't have Dharma practice, but I felt like it was a thing that kept me going in like a positive direction where at times I felt just like giving up, you know, and, and, uh, you know, I still, um, you know, I, I, you know, she, she eventually came home and she's, you know, she's able to do a lot of stuff. She's able to drive and she's able to, um, you know, going back to work probably like maybe next month is the plan, you know, to work in like a call center kind of job. But um, I guess I would, I'd get, I guess I would kind of, you know, talk about this phase in terms of renunciation, you know, and I really, um, I think I really initially lived in the initial, initial scope a lot, you know, and it was, uh, you know, it was a place that I, my motivation and, and, you know, after this stroke, you know, I kind of realized that, you know, a lot of these things that I was trying to arrange my life to make myself happy and to make my family happy and to kind of just try to be a little bit comfortable and say, I'm sorry, you know, I just realized that, you know what, it's, it's, a um, there's really no safety, you know, there's all kinds of things that, um, that can happen suddenly and just totally shift your life. I mean, you know, it was, it was, a, um, and this was a great example of that. And, you know, we're all subject to, you know, birth, aging, sickness, and death. And then even like we spend all this time trying to find the things that we want to make us happy. And, and even that falls short. And, and kind of some of it is we're look, we're looking for something to kind of, you know, satisfy this kind of deep feeling that we have for spiritual matters that isn't really satisfiable except by, by having a dark, a spiritual practice. So, um, you know, from this point, I think, um, I think we really, I really defined my life differently, you know, and part of it was I kind of had to, you know, we went from this place of being very mobile to being at home a lot, you know, and, uh, 
And the funny thing was too, is like, you know, it's a strange thing to, to be married to someone for many years. And then all of a sudden, like you, their personality is different, you know, and it, um, it can be kind of a sad thing, but it can also be kind of a wondrous thing. You know, my wife and I, we don't fight like we used to. We don't, we don't, uh, it's kind of funny. We used to have all this tension between us about the kids and all these different things. And when she had her stroke, it was like something just changed, you know, and I can't, I still am kind of a little bit um, baffled by it, but maybe part of it is we had like this, this point of where we had to kind of mutually come together to try to like help each other and work together to try to help her, you know, overcome her, um, you know, all the stuff that she's been through. But, um, so moving forward, I, I, now I'm, I want to talk about the, um, the grade scope, you know, and the grade scope, you know, the intermediate scope is, is kind of focused on like liberation, personal liberation and, uh, and renunciation, you know, and the grade scope is more focused on, um, enlightenment, you know, and I think that, um, in order to have the motivation to become enlightened, we kind of need to know a little bit about what enlightenment means. You know, and that's a massive, huge <laughs> subject in itself. But I guess I, um, my view of enlightenment, it, it kind of changes based on as as my knowledge kind of expands about about the path. You know, but enlightenment in a general way kind of is like being less self absorbed, being less self centered. You know, um, being free from self grasping. You know, and um, thinking of others, you know, and so with the progression of that, um, you know, we have a whole bunch of practices in the grade scope to deal with um, how to overcome our self grasping and how to benefit other people, you know, and the, um, you know, the path is is the path of the bodhisattva, you know, and um, I, you know, I um, I think when I first came to um, to Dharma, I, it always amazed me that um, there are all these practices about how to become more compassionate, you know, and I always felt like, oh, people are just like born compassionate or they're just born this way or that way. But we have all these practices that we can, um, we can practice to, um, to be more compassionate people. And I think that, um, you know, the motivation part of it is, is uh, very, is, is tricky. You know, I mean, I feel like you know, I sit down to do my sadhana and I sit down to um, to practice at different times. And it's kind of like a it's a real um, it takes effort for me to kind of generate this idea that, like, I'm doing this for other people, you know, and sometimes during the day I can kind of think I'm doing this for other people, you know. But for most a lot of the a lot of it, it's a it's a thing that I have to generate, you know, and, and the idea is, is that we eventually have this thing where it, it kind of arises spontaneously in, in ourselves. But in order for that to arise spontaneous, we have to train and we have to practice and we have to ingrain this stuff into like our inner being. And, uh, you know, I, um, I can see in myself that it's a gradual process, but I think that, um, I think seeing other people that are far along the path are what motivates me, you know, seeing other masters, seeing Lama Jimpa, seeing um, different, um, different people who have practiced for long periods of time, you know, and that, you know, that's kind of the motivation, you know, is being able to see other people that, um, that have practiced like that. And so, you know, um, you know, where this seems kind of, very linear in a way it's like it's it's it it's kind of circular you know and for me i um spent a lot of years kind of practicing you know on my own you know after um having teachers for a while and and i felt like um you know and i would and i would go to do retreats and i would go to do teachings and i um i followed lama zopa for a long time and i took a lot of teachings from him and I hit, I hit this one point where, um, you know, I was really kind of confused and I was like, man, I have all these practices and I don't have all this time to practice. And, and I got all these commitments and, um, and I wrote Zom Lama Zopa a letter and I said, you know, here's my situation. My life is super busy and I don't really have the time and 
how do I keep all these commitments? And he sent me back this card. And when I opened it, it said, practice long room. You know, and it was just like, it was such a, um, it was, it, it made it so easy. You know what I mean? And, and I think that the benefit that we have from having direct contact with teachers is, is that I constantly, you know, I'm trying to walk along the path and I get diverted, you know, and I walk over here for a while, you know, and I'm doing something over here and having a teacher, they can say, here's the path right here. And so I kind of walk back over to the path and I'm kind of walk, practicing, I'm walking on the path. And when I was practicing on my own more, I would get freaking diverted for long periods of time, it would seem like, before I would kind of come back to the path, you know? And I think the really great thing that I appreciate with Lama Jimpa is, is that, um, you know, I go into his office once a month at least, you know? And it's like, here's the path. <laughs> here's, here's the path. So, you know, I come back on the path. And I, um, you know, coming to teachings here, you know, I mean, it, um, I think this, this last year has really, um, has been an eye opener. I mean, it's just, it's, everything is made so easy for us. You know, there's a temple here, you know, you come to the temple, there are all these teachings that, um, that kind of direct you, you know, about what to do and how to practice, you know, and it, um, you know, I feel, I, I really feel a lot of gratitude for that. So it, um, and I know that, it doesn't happen in a vacuum. There are a lot of people that are responsible for making making this Dharma Center um, what it is. But um, I don't know. In closing, um, you know, we don't really know how much time that we have. You know, we don't know um, really what's around the next corner. You know, and uh, you know, if we can if we can practice with the idea that of like this day is a really important day and I need to try to make the best use that I can of it. And, uh, and you know what too is really, um, you know, it's about planting seeds, you know, and when, um, you know, when you go to bed at night, think about it, like what seeds did I plant today? Did I plant a bunch of stuff that's going to grow like, like a stuff that I, that's not really beneficial or did I plant something that's really beneficial and that's going to blossom into something really great, you know? And I, um, I think it, I think with that, that's probably like a good place for me to end. So thanks everybody. It's great to see all these, uh, smiley faces and, um, there's a lot of benefit, I guess, to, um, to us all being here in zoom, you know, even though we can't be here in person. So at this point, I'm going to um, turn it back over to Connor. You want to take questions and comments? Yeah, that's great. All right. So um, this is the fun part. You guys get to um, ask any questions if you like. Just uh, raise your hands or uh, unmute. Hi, Brad. It's Dana. Hey, Dana. Hey. I, I'm so glad you... Um, you, you spoke today. I wasn't really sure uh, what we, you were going to speak on, or we haven't really gotten to to get to know each other, you know, the last year or so. But, um, God, that was an incredible story. And, um, you know, I struggle with the long rim because it is so, for me, it's so kind of dry. But it's really nice to, to hear your perspective that, it, you know, teaching the path and how to conduct our lives, it, it, meant, it means a lot to me that you gave your interpretation of it because I think it, it gives it more um, more meaning to me when I read it that there's oh Brad does this so I, you know I, I gotta do I gotta do it now <laughs> so I appreciate that a lot great thanks Dana yeah. um, Susan yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for the talk, Brad. I found it actually pretty inspiring. Um, you know, we're just lay practitioners. We're just doing it day by day by day. And um, I was just really touched and um, quite inspired to see a lay practitioner just, you know, keeping on, keeping on. That's kind of what we're doing step by step. So thanks very much for the talk. It was great. Great, thanks, Susan. Karen? Yeah, um, thanks so much, 
Brad, for giving this talk. I, I just really admire your, how long that you've been really walking this spiritual path, uh, you know, with and, and having so much bodhicitta, it seems like along the way, that's what I kept hearing you when you say, you know, you ended up in rehab at 21, but then you came out and you went into nursing and then your whole life just, you just kept that bodhicitta motivation the whole time. And even with all of these things happening, you're just so consistent. And so that, I agree with what, like what Susan and Dana were saying, it's so inspiring to me because in my life, it was more like a earthquakes or something, you know, that I, you know, I'd blow up and something would happen and then I'd fall in a hole and then I'd crawl out. But it just seemed like you're so, you're so strong that way. And um, that's real inspiring. So thank you so much. Great. Thanks, Karen. Brad, you know, I did have a question for you. I, I, it sounds like, you know, through your Dharma practice, there was quite a bit of, of maybe loss of, I don't know, maybe if you, if you describe it as loss of faith in, in your Sangha members or the community, like, how did you, how did you maintain like that, that sense of, I don't know, optimism that, you know, I'll find the next thing that will feed me. Like, I don't know. I don't know if a lot of people would be able to do that so quickly, or I don't know if you did it quickly. You know what I, you know what I, and I, this is, this, that's a great question because I, I meant to talk about this a little bit, but I never, um, I forgot. But I think what I did too was I realized that, you know, we're all just people, you know, people that are teachers, people that are, um, that are monks and nuns. And like the Dharma to me is the part that's really the pure part, you know, and we all, we all make mistakes. And, and some people make, yeah, you know, I mean, some people, it's, you know, more than others, but, but I, I guess I, um, I guess I put my faith in the Dharma rather than people, you know, and I, and I guess there's a certain amount of faith maybe that we need to have in people, you know, in the teachers that we have. And, but it seems like the, um, the depth of it is like the lineage and the, and the Dharma, you know, and maybe the, the length that, you know, it's come all the way to us. So. You know, I tried to, um, I tried not to get discouraged and I try to just think in that way. Thanks. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? What does your, what does your wife think about your Dharma practice? Is she a practitioner? Have you converted her? You know, my, um, it's interesting. My wife is not a practitioner, but we, um, we raised our kids in the Buddhist church, you know, which is right, um, you know, downtown or, uh, you know, over on Riverside, you know, and Baba Shito was the, um, the main teacher there at the time. And, and, uh, you know, that kind of fit her lifestyle. I mean, her kind of ideas a little bit better, you know, and, uh, and I think a lot of it was a social thing too, you know, and, and, uh, you know, and so, um, you know, we, we found kind of a common ground in that sense, you know, and it was, uh, um, you know, it was a great place for my kids to grow up and play basketball and do Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts and do all these activities with kind of the basis of like, of, of you know, the Dharma ethics and and, uh, and morality and all that stuff kind of infused and all that stuff. So it's funny because the, the, um, the SBC, Sacramento Buddhist Church, is the, is kind of the short term of what that, of the temple there. But uh, SBC, they also would confuse it with uh, SBC Sacramento Basketball Club. So, like, almost like people, a lot of a lot of people confuse those two because they were, you know, a lot of people came there for that reason. But we had a great time though, as, as my kids grew up there. Uh, you really incorporated it in so much part of your your life and your family. That's that's really great. I think a lot of Sangha members um, struggle with with that and trying to find somebody who can will tolerate the 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 practices or the the uh, sangha you know stuff that happens so i think that's that's great that you have a partner there that's willing to do that thanks All what's right. your um, no more questions What's your Sangha name? What's your dharm, your refuge name? Uh, Yeshe Darge. Darge. 
Whoa, we have the name of our building. <laughs> Donate Darge, right? So what is that? Right, what, does that what does it mean? You know, I um, I can't tell you offhand. Wait, is it wisdom? I don't know. Ask Connor. I can't, I don't know. Ask Connor. He yeah. knows. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Somebody could Google it. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I think it is wisdom. That's great. I think that's very fitting for you. <laughs> okay. No more questions. All right. Well, well, thanks for the opportunity. And uh, it's funny. I had about ten different talks in my head, and I was really curious about which one was going to come out. So thank you again. <laughs> uh, let's do prayers. Uh, it looks like Marie's here. So Susan, do you want to do those? Sure. Due to the merits of these virtuous actions, may I quickly attain the state of a guru Buddha and lead all living beings without exception into that enlightened state. May the supreme jewel bodhicitta that has not arisen arise and grow, and may that which has arisen not diminish, but increase more and more. In the land encircled by snow mountains, you are the source of all happiness and good. All powerful Chen Rezig Tenzin Gyatso, please remain until samsara ends. May the teachings of the Buddha flourish, and may the upholders of the teachings remain forever. May all migrators achieve happiness, and may they fulfill all their temporary and ultimate goals. Lo Song, magical display of the deep awareness of all the victorious ones, merciful giver of a stream of profound and vast instructions to the fortunate migrators. Please remain always unperishing, unchanging, unfading. Avalokiteshvara, great treasure of objectless compassion. Menzushri, master of flawless wisdom. Vajrapani, destroyer of the entire host of Maras. Sankapa, crown jewel of the snowy land sages. Losangrapa, I make request at your holy feet. All right. Is that it? Yeah. All right. Bye, guys. We're off. Thanks. Thanks, Thank Brad. Thanks. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you, Brad. Thank you, Bradley. That was a great speech. Thank you yeah. very much. <laughs>